We need food to fuel us. But the question is, what is the bare minimum we need to feel satiated and energised while on a journey? Over the last 11 years, I've been on various wee survival trips and expeditions all around the world, sometimes taking no food and only relying on what I can catch and forage, while other times experimenting with the bare minimum ingredients. I've tried many modern camping meals, but they're often very expensive, not versatile, and leave your pack full of single-use packaging. This has led me to wonder what the people of the past made and carried for their food rations. In this video, I'll share my basic principles for food from a survival perspective and discuss three historical rations from different cultures. Inspired by these, I've come up with my own simple survival ration that I affectionately call the Fandabi Bannock. I've found I only need to eat two or three of these a day to keep me full of energy while on an expedition. They can be made very cheaply at home, can be eaten cold or hot, are customisable and can be carried easily with little or no packaging. With just three main ingredients, I'll show you how to easily make them at home. So, stay tuned! Hi folks, Tom from Band Abbey Dozy. Thanks for tuning in. So if you're new to the channel, I like to make videos about wilderness survival skills and martial arts, often from a historical perspective. And what I love so much about these topics is how it forces you to simplify life right down to its absolute basics. And in this video, I'm going to simplify the fourth and the last priority survival, food. Now let's first be clear, I'm not a nutritionist or a dietitian. I'm a survivalist who's interested in simplicity and multifunctionality and my intention with this video is to provide you with principles you can apply for creating a really simple high calorie food ration with flexibility depending on your dietary requirements. Now before I get into it I first off want to say a huge thanks to all the people who support me on my Patreon page. There on the School of the Altan tier I've started releasing some extra online videos with the idea that this could evolve into online courses. There on the School of the Altan tier, you'll find the follow-on video to this one, where I'll show you how to make my Fandabi Bannock on a campfire with some forest ingredients using historical utensils. So consider joining if you're interested. Now this video isn't sponsored by anyone, and ideally in the future, I want the channel to be less reliant on sponsors, and becoming a patron is the best way for helping the channel do that. You can also show some love by buying a t-shirt. First off, what's the limitations to modern survival rations and camping meals? Over the years I've tried many different types, and in terms of convenience, sure, they win absolutely hands down. You just buy them in the shops, stick them in your rucksack, and you're good to go. But I've found they do also have some downsides. The bottle in the bag ones are great because you can eat hot or cold, but then you're carrying a lot of wet weight, and often they don't taste that good cold. The dehydrated meals, super lightweight, but very expensive and not that useful if you're in a situation where you can't heat water. They usually have lots of salt and preservatives and what they both have is a lot of packaging and I found after a long trip your rucksack can end up overflowing with all this litter and even if you're careful you might end up dropping some leaving a trace in the landscape. Not very stealthy. So with this in mind, I wanted to create a food ration I could take on both my modern and historical journeys with the following criteria. 1. Easy and cheap to make in large batches. 2. Be in a bar or biscuit form that could be eaten cold or added to hot water to make a stew. 3. Easy to pack and store my bag for meal plans, something that won't get crushed. 4. Have a long shelf life or be kept in a freezer till needed. Five. High calorie and nutrition to weight ratio. Six, no single use plastic packaging. And seven, tasty and a feel good factor. So in order to create to this ultimate food ration, I thought I first need to simplify and rethink food from a survival perspective, and then look at the past and see what people did for their food rations. So here's my overly simplistic approach to food from a survival perspective. I'm gonna split what our body needs into two categories. One the fuel, what gives our mind and bodies energy? And two, the building blocks, what are the raw materials that allows our cells to repair themselves and allows our body to do all the complex thing it does to keep us alive? 
So under the category of fuel, I'd put fats, carbohydrates, and sugars. And under the category of building blocks, I'd put proteins, micronutrients, vitamins and minerals, and fiber. Now humans have adapted to almost every climate on Earth, but from my experience from doing survival trips in Scotland, I found it's not too hard to get the building blocks from the wild, especially if you're by the coast. Shellfish provide a reliable source of protein, and seaweed can give you your macronutrients. Also, fishing is a great way to get protein. Now, you can get energy from protein alone through ketosis, but this isn't very efficient. So this is why we need the fuel in forms of fats, carbohydrates, and sugars. But these are very hard to find in the wild. I can think of two or three wild edibles you can find in Scotland that can give you carbohydrates. And these are often very seasonal, habitat specific, and require a lot of prior processing before you can actually eat it. Sure, you can get sugars from some uh, wild fruit, but again, this is very seasonal. And for this reason, this is why every civilization on Earth is built upon a reliable source of carbohydrate people could grow. In the East, it was rice. In the Americas, it was corn and potatoes. And in the West, it was wheat, barley, and oats. So with this in mind, I knew the foundation of my ration recipe had to be based on the fuel. Things that are gonna give me energy that's hard to find in the wild. I then could, in theory, get my building blocks from the wild if I had to. But as I'll show you, you could create infinite varieties of this recipe to include the building blocks of protein and micronutrients if you want to. So if fuel is the hardest thing to find in the wild, let me ask you a question. If you could only carry one ingredient with you, what would have the highest calorie to weight ratio plus a very long shelf life? What do you think? To me, it would be some sort of fat. And the king of all fats, in my opinion, is suet or tallow, which is basically rendered suet. Now suet is the fat found around the kidneys of a cow. It is packed full of calories and it has an incredibly long shelf life. This is why it is one of the main ingredients in the Native American survival food known as pemmican. Now pemmican is a food originating from North America and it basically consists of a lean meat that has been dried and then ground into a flour. This flour is then mixed with suet. Sometimes dried berries and spices are also added. It has an incredibly long shelf life, you know, the years and, or even into the decades. And there's stories of people surviving off this stuff for months or even years at a time. Now the secret to pemmican's long shelf life is getting rid of the moisture through the drying process and then by allowing the suet to soak into the meat it stops the moisture from returning. Now I've made pemmican before and it's very tasty but the slicing and the drying of the meat can take a long time and I wanted my main ingredient of my survival ration to be a carbohydrate. However this use of suet as a high calorie preservative really inspired me. Another historical ration that inspired me was hardtack, or ship's biscuits, which has been used by armies and navies from all around the world in ages. It's very simple. It's just flour, water, and a bit of salt, pushed into a flat disc, and baked for hours and hours on end until it becomes rock solid. It lasts a long time if it's kept dry. If it brings on moisture, then it can go off. And there's famous stories of these biscuits getting infested by weevils during long sailing journeys. It's a bit boring by itself as a ration and it does need some sort of fat to stop the moisture getting back in. The final historical food that inspired me was bannock breads, originating from Scotland. A bannock bread is basically an unleavened bread, its main ingredients being oatmeal, barley flour, butter and water. To me it's the tastiest out of all three and I like that addition of oatmeal. Oatmeal just sits well on my stomach, I like the way it releases energy, and it also provides a bit of extra fiber and protein. The butter, although tasty, doesn't have that long a shelf life though. So this got me thinking, can I combine the best things from these historical rations? Can I use the suet from the pemmican, the long baking process of the hardtack, mixed with the rough ingredient ratios of the bannock breads to create the ultimate simple food ration? Thus, the Fandabi Bannock was born. So how do you actually make a Fandabi Bannock? Well, it basically consists of three ingredients with a wee bit of hot water to help out. 
The rough ratios I've been using is one part fat, one part oatmeal, and two parts flour. Of course, the fat I'm using is the wonderful suet. You can get it fresh from the butchers, but it's often easier to buy it in pellet form in a box like this. Now, if you're vegan, you could use coconut oil. It's also packed full of calories and also has a long shelf life. If you're gluten intolerant, you don't have to use wheat flour. You could use a gluten-free flour, such as rice flour or even potato flour. It tastes pretty good. With these three ingredients, you can add whatever flavorings you want. You could make it sweet by adding sugar and dried fruit. You could make it savory by adding beef jerky and herbs and spices. Just go mad with it. But this is the three ingredients I've been using. I'll show you how you can make a sweet bannock in a modern kitchen, and then I'll show you how you can make it out in the woods. Preheat your oven to 200 degrees Celsius. Grab a mixing bowl and add your one part oatmeal, your two parts flour. One, two. You can also add your flavorings now. Because I'm making a sweet bannock, I'm gonna add a couple tablespoons of brown sugar and a spattering of raisins. And I'm just eyeballing all this and mix that up. I'm also gonna add some allspice just for giggles. Add your one part fat to a saucepan and let it melt. Once your fat is melted into a liquid, add it to your flour and oatmeal mix and give it a good stir before the fat hardens. Once your mixture, so it looks like a crumble, now you just slowly add small amounts of boiling water at a time until the mixture turns into a dough that you can knead with your hands. Try not to add too much water to start with because then you need to add more flour to counteract it. So just add small amounts of water at a time and just keep, keep mixing. It's time to use my hands. Let's get in there and knead it. Knead it like you would bread. And you want to get it to this sort of consistency where you can knead it in your hands and it doesn't, it doesn't stick to your hands. At this point, get a baking tray ready with some baking paper on it. And what I like to do is just add just a little bit of oatmeal and a tad of flour at the bottom of your bowl. And you're just gonna use this to coat your bannocks before you put them on the baking tray. So when you got to this consistency, I just like to break off chunks about the size of your fist. Smush them into biscuit sizes that are just wider than your hand. You kind of pat them down. You want them to be about a finger thick and about as wide as your hand. You can then just coat them with some oatmeal and flour. It's just going to stop it from sticking. Kind of rub that on. Pat it on. And there is one bannock ready to go. Lay it on the baking paper and do it again. Place them on your baking tray. And these are now ready to go in the oven. Now place your bannocks in a preheated oven at around 200 degrees Celsius. Now after baking for 10 minutes at 200 degrees Celsius, you can see they've already gone golden brown at top. You could take these out now, let them cool, if you uh, were going to eat them within the next uh, week or so. But using this theory of the hard tack, of kind of uh, baking it long at a uh, lower heat, what I might try doing is turn the temperature down to 50 degrees Celsius and just leave them in for about an hour or so just to make sure that all the moisture gets out of them. So these have been Baking at a low heat, 50 degrees Celsius for an hour, just to get them nice and dry. I'm gonna take these out, place them on a wire rack, and let them cool down completely. 
Oh, they smell good. So there you go, folks. There are the finished Bandabi Bannocks. Now remember, these are our food ration. Something that's easy to carry, that's going to give you lots of energy while on a journey. Not something to have your entire diet as. And also aware, it's probably not something that's going to win any baking competitions. Now, how would I describe them? If I could describe them in one word, I would say dense. Okay, they're pretty hard, but they're not brittle, which is important, so that they won't get crushed in your pack. The outside of them is kind of crispy, but in the middle, all that suet has collected to add some flexibility, you could say. Now, obviously, the taste is going to depend a lot and what, um, you know, flavorings and other ingredients you've added to it. But with sugar and raisins, it's delicious. It's kind of like Landis bread from Lord of the Rings. You don't need to eat a lot of it. And there's something about that suet and the oats that seem to swell in your stomach, filling you up. When I'm on a journey, I just tend to break off little bits, eat it. It does help to <laughs> wash it down with water to help with digestion. Now I didn't add any raising agents because raising agents would, you know, make it a bit more palatable and softer and fluffier, but it would make it crumbly and it would fall apart in your back. Basically, you want it hard enough so that if someone threw this at you, it would hurt them. Now my favorite way of carrying the bannocks without using plastic is using beeswax wraps. You can either make these or buy these. It's basically a square piece of cloth that's impregnated with beeswax. I've added a button in one corner with a length length of string. With this you can make food parcels for every day of your journey. Now say if you made three different flavors of bannocks you could have one for your dinner, one for your lunch and one for your breakfast and just stack them like this. You can then fold the corners of your wax wrap over with the corner of the button last just like this then you can use this string to wrap around all the way around your parcel. Holding it in place. And there you go. There is a 24 hour ration parcel. You can then make multiple ones of these, how many days you're going out, and just stack them in your rucksack like this. Now, of course, if you sat on them, Yes, they will get crushed, but they can withstand the normal amount of bashing, bashing around in your rucksack. And at the end of your journey, rather than having mountains of packaging, you just have a few bits of fabric that you can reuse on your next journey. Now, what about the shelf life of these Fandabi Bannocks? Well, there'd be so many factors at play, especially with different ingredients you would add to it, that I can't give you an accurate answer. But to me, with the three basic ingredients, if they were packaged well right after baking and stored in a cool, dry, dark place, I don't see why they wouldn't last for several years, at least. So there you go, folks. Hope you enjoyed this video on my Fan Dabby Bannocks. Try them out. Let me know in the comments how you get on. If you want extra lessons, check out my Patreon page. Thanks so much for watching. I'll be back with another video as soon as I can. Happy cooking.